everybody. Good evening, brother, and welcome to our March edition of Members Presents, uh, hosted and sponsored by the Earth Reconstruction Initiative. It's actually a, a free event that we put on. Um, we have the facility provided to us uh, by the Southwest School of Arts that really helps us enable uh, this event. Um, it's always following our board meetings, which are at 6 o'clock, and um, we start the presentation shortly after at 7.15. Uh, this month, we actually have one of our um, technical, well, one of our committee um, chairs. It's our technical committee chair, Michael Donahue, who is a structural engineer. And he also has a company called Meritech Engineering, which uh, specializes in earthen construction, um, among other things. And uh, I guess that's about every anything. That's about everything. Um, we'll just get to it then with Michael. He's going to be speaking to us on uh, Solum Isano, which I think is going to be Latin. Is that Latin? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's Latin for um, for soil and health, which is uh, similar to Spanish. So some people might uh, catch that right there. And um, I'm interested to know uh, the cautionary tale, and I hope you are all as well. So without further ado, Michael. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, Tonight, uh, well, first off, I have three things to say before we begin, sort of preambulatory statement. First off, this talk is about the cautionary part of earthen materials. Um, this is more inside baseball, if you will. This is for people who are on the construction side and maybe on the design side. This is about the safety and health of the workers. We do a lot of work in large, with large construction companies. And when you go to the weekly site meetings, the very first thing on the agenda is safety, safety report. And that's all about physical safety. It's probably a response to OSHA so they don't avoid the fines and whatnot. But at any rate, it's also about lawsuits and it's about the actual equity of the uh, employees. Many of these companies are employee owned, so they care about the employees as much as anything else. And that got my attention recently about earthen materials. Uh, we all talk about the good things about earth and when they indeed are there. However, in the first phases of a project, when you're dealing with live earth right out of the ground, it's loose, it's moist, and it's the way nature provides it. That's a different phase of earth, and that's the phase we're going to be talking about here. Um, second thing is uh, this is going to be kind of a focus group. Uh, I'm hopefully going to present the same thing at Earth USA, and uh, I'm going to. This is new. That would have, there's almost no literature, in fact, there is no literature on this particular thing. So you guys are a guinea pig, the first time out of the gate. So when you hear something that makes no sense, you don't understand it, please tell me. And uh, try to keep your shoes on, don't throw your shoes, no hostilities, <laughs> just, please just be vocal about your concerns or about what, what I'm not saying correctly or what, what I've confused. And the last thing is, when doing this, I realized also that in order to understand uh, the health of the earth, you have to understand the earth because the biology of the earth and the geology, the, the, the earth and materials evolve together and you, they are a system together. And you can't talk about one without understanding the other. So we're going to have a quick two minute tour of the soil system. This is called pedology. Pedon from Greek for the earth, the ground. Oh, it's, 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 it's related to the Latin word pet is for foot, your foot on the ground, all, the, all those related sort of things. And this system here, we'll talk about the soil system. I'm going to tell you where we are in terms of current modern technologies. In fact, I have to figure it out. There's a, uh, we are blessed in the last probably 30 years, uh, the FAO and the NRCS, the National Soil, what well, used to be a Soil Conservation Service, have done a lot of work producing a monumental work. First time this has occurred in human history. Oh my God. This book here, a soil taxonomy. This will put you to sleep, I <laughs> guarantee it. <laughs> this tried to take the confused world of soils and give names to everything to identify what the soils is. I've heard over and over again, soils are too complicated to really know anything about them. You just take them up, you feel them, and you just make your decision there. And the truth is, there's been a lot of work in the last 30 years 
to get rid of that because everyone's worried about that. This the farm. This is all about agriculture because they're concerned about the same sort of things. Obviously, this examines the soils of the. This is mostly North America. They examine the soils of the, of the world. The FAO it takes on the world. Uh, this just is North America. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Then we're going to talk about the biological agents. And we're going to talk about uh, how they, the two relate to some extent, so you can get some idea of what to expect in certain circumstances. Then we're going to talk about, after that, how the biological agents interact with the human body. The goal of this is to get to this guy here in the middle. When you put all these things together, what does that mean for the guy working in that system? Okay, that's our game plan, if you will. And we could move on to the next one. Yeah. First, the two-minute pedology. We're going to cover that book in two minutes. <laughs> you got it? Okay, here's the system. Here's the soil. It's a result of four systems plus another system which encompasses it all, which is time. Typically, this works on the order of millions of years, these things working together. The hydrosphere, i.e. the moisture in the soil, whether or not you have heavy rainfalls, etc., whether it's out in the desert where you have arid soils, arid or, or monosols, or histosols, which are very swampy soils. The atmosphere, which has to do with the gases in the atmosphere. The biosphere, the, as I said, the actual biology in the soil changes the soil. It breaks, it's one of the agents that breaks down the rocks, if you will, from the magma that comes up from the earth. And the last is the actual local uh, geology, what type of volcanic action happened, what kind of magma came up, was it mafic or was it basaltic? That makes a difference, mafic being uh, granites, or mafic. Mafic is, Ma is magnesium, and Fe is iron. They have magnesium and iron in them. Basalts have a whole different other set of things, a lot of iron. Anyway, so that's, that's the basic thing. And here, to give you some idea, these, this book here in the FA have broken down the major classes of soils into 12 orders of soils. And really these orders of soils are simply assemblies of what they call diagnostic layers. Different kinds of soils, different chemistries, different causes and whatnot. And this gives you some idea across the planet how it varies so much. I won't try to explain this. This is going to be the... If there's any interest in this particular topic, this could be another two or three members presents if, if you all want to get down with that but this is quite, quite involved but this gives you some idea quite involved here's the u.s off that same map and here here we are in texas you can tell over here this color here for instance is going to be a rid of sols you can guess what that is that's sand that's uh, sandy arid soils up through here this is going to be monosols this is going to be the fertile bread basket of the u.s let me go on to the next one here's, and here's texas now, these drawings are really kind of cartoons. The truth is, down at the granular level, this is much more complicated than this. But this gives you the general trends of the kinds of soils you could expect to find in these areas. In our area here, we're going to have a lot of monosols. This is going to be a lot of the farmlands. Vertisols, that's going to be the black clays that we're all familiar with. And then down to the south are alphasols, which is a little different animal. It has to do with the rainfall and whatnot. This gives you an idea of those two. This is fertile ground. You can see in here, this is, this is really important. This is key to understanding the biology, in fact. You'll notice in these, uh, there's different, various layers. That's going to repeat on all the complexity of soils. If you look at what, know what you're looking for, you'll see layers. There's this layer, there's a thin layer here. There's a very deep clay layer, black clump of, and down here you can barely see it. It changes color again. Over here in utilisols, again, you have a dark, darkish layer, a mid layer level, and then you have a lower level. Those all have meaning, those aren't just random sorts of things. Well, the, here, the other influence we talked about, the uh, uh, temperature and the air. This is in a map of the temperature regimes across the planet. You can obviously see north to south, there's kind of a variation across things. This is the frigid north. These are the tundra areas. These are the temperate areas. This is the tropical areas. Then the next thing is going to be the uh, water. Now, you, in the North American, you'll see there's a big difference between the, the temperature regimes and the water regimes. So we have a complicated system here, a kind of a matrix of conditions that drive soils in North America. Anyway, let's, let's move on from there. 
Now here's the key thing, and this is the thing you've got to remember when we talk about these other bacteria and all the other microbes. Every soil has got these layers, and this is universal through all those soils. You can, if you know what you're looking for, you will always see this organization. There is order in nature after all. The O layer is the organic layer that we all see right at the plant roots. This is the heaviest part of where they have the densest part of what they call the rhizosphere, which is the rhizomes of the plants. The rhizomes of the plants host a particular set of bacteria, bacterial colonies. This is the B layer where, where the, the organics tend to start to fall away and get less and less. And you have sometimes leaching of the soils from up here. They wash down into this. That changes the chemistry of the soils. And now at the bottom you have, we are getting into the lithosphere. This is the bedrock. If you know. You're starting to see the rocks starting to show up and it generally changes chemistry. This is ultimately all about chemistry. Okay, here's the next thing. And this has to do with scales of things. Uh, this amazes people about how big and small and what the different scales of particles are in the soil. Sand, we're all familiar with. That's something you can see. Silts, in this room right here, are out of the human vision. You can't really see silt particles. They are, if you know magnifying glass, you can see them. They are down on the order of uh, 0.072 uh, millimeters, or 72 microns. That's 72 millionths of a meter. And then here's the, this is the, the this is the most important, the most important part for us life on planet Earth, is the clays. They are down around two microns, about two millionths of a meter, down to almost light wave length. Light, the, uh, the ultraviolet end of the spectrum is about 450 micron, uh, nanometers and wavelengths. Clays go down to less than a nanometer. They are hard to resolve with a scanning electron microscope. Uh, that's, that's the whole, clays themselves are a whole topic and that, that's, we'll, we'll have to take up that at a different time. Anyway, and the interesting thing is, is where the, where the life occurs in these things. Down at this level here, below bacteria, is where the viruses are. They are typically down about 30 nanometers. You hear about a cold virus, that's about 30 nanometers. And they are almost countless in the environment around it. In fact, viruses are a part of our DNA. There's a very interesting book called A Crack in Creation, and another book called Virolution. If you want to read about viruses, and this is all new information, The Crack in Creation is a story of the CRISPR. You perhaps heard of CRISPR? Mm -hmm. Well, what CRISPR is doing is taking viral DNA that's embedded into our human DNA and using the tools that viruses have discovered, how they insert themselves in our DNA. It's a fascinating story, I encourage you to read it. And the other thing about uh, viruses, the estimates are they are probably the first forms of life or the transition between chemistry and life is down, occurs down on the viral level. It's a, probably a two billion year old story. Life is, bacteria are probably a six, less than a billion year old story. And above this we have microbes, bacteria and protozoa, helmus, and uh, the, big, the biggest thing, oddly enough, is called fungi. But one of the biggest living animals on the earth, biggest living being on the earth, is a fungus. Mm -hmm. Some fungi, based on their DNA, are as much as a kilometer in size in the forest bed. That's, that's an extraordinary thing. Anyway, agents of disease. Let's move on to the actual diseases themselves. Yeah. Uh, just a question, when you said they're down here, do you mean they physically reside there, or they're just that particle size? Particle size. Okay. That on the, in, in the size spectrum layer at the lower end, or the smaller end, depending on your preferences. Here we go with viruses. Viruses are, like I say, this transition between chemistry and life. They have not, they cannot exist outside some living host, uh, and they have the strangest forms you can imagine. This is probably a bacteriophage, which means it. this is, phage is the Greek for eat. This one eats bacteria. You thought you had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of these are all the, the virus. Here's a hantavirus, another hemorrhagic fever, which is a North American problem. Uh, this is in a similar vein, if you will, to the Ebola. It has the same sort of symptoms, not quite as contagious, not quite as horrific. 
This is a list of some of the viral pathogens you may have heard. You may have heard of some of these sort of things. I don't know. Some of these are, we don't know much, for instance, about the rota, the Norwalk virus. It exists. It's, it's very deadly, but we have almost no information. There's no cure for it. A lot of these things there's no cure for. Moving on, this has to be quick. Forgive me, this has to be quick. The soil bacteria. The next thing up the sta uh, stage is soil bacteria. They run from in size from about uh, 5 microns up to about 50 microns in size. So they're still bigger than the virus. virus. This gives you an idea of their size. Here's one of those bacteria phases, eating a bacteria. Just like fleas on a dog. You, you've heard about even the fleas have fleas. Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a, a, a universe of bacteria. There are more than 10,000 subspecies of about 1,000 different kinds of bacteria. Here's probably one of the more deadly ones, tetanus. Hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about tetanus. Botulism, toxin, typhoid fever. These are all bacteria that are found in soils. We can move on to the next one. And here's a list of some of the soils. Bacillus anthrax is a bacterial infection. Uh, what, what other? Uh, here's tetanus. Q fever, it's a terrible disease. Tularemia, shingulosis. And here's another one I didn't even listen to farmer's lung. Uh, the same problems that earth workers have, farmers have. The same problem that miners have, silicosis. The collection of, of small silicon particles in the lines. We'll get to that in a second. The next scale up there is about from about 20, an, uh, 20 microns up to as much as 2 millimeters for the protozoans. They are the bugs you can actually see under a small microscope, which you might look at in the laboratory as a kid. Uh, Cyclosporin, Guardia, Cryptosporidium. These are all things that are typically tried to, when you purify water. These are the kinds of things you're trying to kill with chlorine and whatnot. And here's a list of some of them. Terrible one. And here's the ones that we had to be careful what photographs we put in there because they get to be kind of horrific. Uh, these are the helmets. They are nematodes, they are actually worm, tiny little worms. They run from about 50, uh, 50 microns up to, well, they can be quite large. They can fill up your body in that. They can, they can kill you. Um, they, they're all found in the soil, particular horizons, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, trichinosis, uh, hookworm. I'm working with a lady in Africa now on the design of earthen floors. Guitar, guitar? Yeah, guitar, guitar. Hey, go on in. Uh, and the, in Africa, there's a problem with they have earthen floors that are unarmored, if you will, unprepared. And one of this one species of worm which can get into you through your skin that was very small in the larval stage that will actually penetrate your skin without having to have it cut is the hookworm. It's endemic in most tropical conditions. So is, uh, do we have schistosomiasis up here? No, not in, not picture. We don't have so. Anyway, all of these things, they conduct part of their life cycle in the human body. Uh, it's a, they're, they're horrific diseases. Perhaps you've heard of things like tapeworm. Those are all illness. All of those are in the U.S. Most, yeah, most all of these can be found in the U.S. Pretty well, so. And uh, here's a, here's a tapeworm. The hookworm is probably one of the most problematic ones. And schistosomiasis. Uh, that really did some work on schistosomiasis and we are at Peace Corps. Let's move on. Here we go with the soil fungi. Uh, another uh, happy creature. All inhabit this uh, soils. Um, this is, I have difficulty uh, pronouncing it. Do we have it up here? Which one? Cox. Coxidiomedes, whatever. Coxidiosis. Yes, that one. It's, it's on the list. It's on the list, sorry. Uh, some of the terrible things, these are all found in the soils. Fungal meningitis is a terrible one. Uh, crypto I can't pronounce it. Barely. And aspergillus. This one here is a, a famous one for being transported on the dust. Um, dust storm, you may have heard in the uh, most, in the uh, summer months, some hurricanes are suppressed by African dust. 
Well, in that dust is oftentimes transported this fungi, aspergillus, and it causes a disease called aspergillosis. It's a lung inflection. Typically, it, it promotes the uh, asthma attacks and uh, uh, breathing problems. I walked through the Caribbean. So this, and this, these dust storms, they can spread around the planet. Dust storms in Central Asia come across the North Pacific and enter the U.S. This is a global transportation of dust around the world. Here are some of the most more famous. Here's valley fever. This is endemic to the southwest of the U.S. Histoplasmosis. And, uh, and here's aspergillus, aspergillus again. And there's a long list. There are some, uh, what was it, 100,000 different species of fungi, but only about 300 of them are known to be pathogenic to humans. So it's not like they're all bad, but the ones that are bad, are bad. Okay, pathways in the body. This is, this is where we get down to the people part. Respiratory pathways. This is, again, aspergillus, transported on the dust in the wind. These problems have been with us for a long time. These are Egyptians chipping away uh, on the, the pyramid. This is off a uh, pyramid or off a tomb's wall. Perhaps you're familiar with this scene here, work, earth workers working in a very dusty environment with only a bandana on, down to a common thing on a job site, and this one here, processing raw earth. All these producing dust. The U.S. Environmental Agency has got a program called the 2.5M uh, uh, program trying to prevent silicosis basically, which is the transport of these dust particles into the human body. We can spit out, you can feel and spit out uh, dust particles down to about 10 microns. You'll just cough them out. They'll get caught in the, the moisture of your upper mouth and you'll just cough them out. With a lot of wheezing, you can get them down to 5 microns. You can get those out. But down at around uh, 2.5 microns, they are so small. Here are the human hair. Here is uh, a five mic or 10 microns, and here is the 2.5 microns. You can see they're getting progressively smaller. These can go all the way into the, your, your uh, lungs, and they won't come out, and they will accumulate in your lungs. The silicosis you hear about miners having is typically that size particle. This is an example of a large particle. Now, the next thing is skin contact. This is just dust particles. Bacteria, dirt, accumulating on your skin, but carrying probably one of those other agents we talked about earlier. The skin is somewhat transparent. You can have uh, uh, bacterial particles can actually penetrate through the cell wall, through cells, get into your dermis. They can go between the cells. They can fall down hair follicles and get to the interior of your body. Ultimately, they can penetrate all the way to your bloodstream. And these, some of these are, uh, will penetrate into the, the inhalation ones, do follow a similar route through the tissues of your lungs. They can get to your bloodstream, and some cases of tuberculosis have been caused by inhaled particles. So these things, if you let them sit on your skin for an extended period of time, they will actually penetrate your body. The helmets, for instance, they can penetrate your body. The other thing is ultraviolet radiation. Uh, we've all heard of skin cancer. Typically, it's the UVA uh, rays that penetrate the deepest. The UVB rays typically get absorbed in the outer layers. The UVA rays, which is most sunscreens protecting against the UVA, uh, can penetrate all the way down to your basal cells. They can generate uh, squamous cell sarcomas, cancer. The next thing is uh, up there is how, is there, these are all pathways in the human body, is ingestion. These are the ones you might guess of. These are the ones when you swallow it, when you swallow earthen materials or soil, it's called geophagia. You heard about the bacteriophage, well these are geophage, that's us swallowing dirt. Again, some, most bacteria are killed by your intestinal, your stomach acids. Some, however, uh, will penetrate into your body, will survive the route. Most, a lot of the helmets, for instance, you saw, they, they can actually survive your neck and get into your mouth. The most difficult one is tetanus. It's a universal problem. 
but for all of these, these are pretty well, most of these are pretty well understood in terms of how they get into their body, how they reproduce in your body, and how, they are, how their life cycle is completed. We have, obviously, we have vaccines for these. These are not long enough we have vaccines. Back to that Valley's fever. Valley, mo, mo, as we saw in the other one, tetanus is worldwide. Valley fever, however, has a definite range. There's a few spots in the Middle East and in Africa that have it as well. But here we are playing great, as you could imagine, over in the same area where we have our Ridisol. The Central Valley of California, Southern Arizona, and a little bit here in Texas, far west Texas. And although, although since San Antonio is right about there, uh, this isn't on that alien. Uh, but again, this is this is a, uh, a fungi. There's Aspergillus. Again, a worldwide phenomenon spread around the world, and that's what it looks like on the program. It's like a little plant. Now, this is the heart of this. This is really the reason why I'm doing this. All of those guys before, remember we talked about the soil structure? Well, about 99% of all of those bugs are found in that top O and A layer. You get below that layer, the top soil, that's where the nutrients are, that's where all the life is. You get below that into the B horizon, where you have mostly the alluviated clays and whatnot, is where there's insufficient oxygen, there's insufficient carbon, typically, to sustain life on the scale there is at the surface. So, guess what? With the right management, you can lower the risk of these things down to background levels, the kind of just walking around the street you have. You can't get rid of your exposure to these things. But by proper management of the soil and your personal hygiene, you can lower it down to that level. It starts with management of the site. Understand the site history. Some of these bacteria are transported through animals and through their, uh, through their digestive system, their uh, fecal material on the ground. If you are, it has been found that up to 90 meters away from a feedlot, the bacteria produced by the animals in that feedlot are found in the soil. Uh, we don't know how they get from 90 meters away. That's a long way. That's 300 feet. But uh, they, that's capable. So you have to know what your site is, what it has been. If it's agricultural land, for instance, all the the uh, uh, not only should you not be using topsoil from agricultural lands, uh, they have oftentimes all the fertilizer create a very rich, dense microbiological environment. So you want to know if you're dealing with former agricultural lands, lands that have been fertilized for extended period of time, you probably have a fairly vigorous biological activity in the soil. So you need to know that. You want to watch your site drainage. Many of these things are transported into drainage water. So that even though the, the bacteria may be somewhere else, they are not uniform in the soil. If you have water draining from an infected area into your area, you're going to have the same bacteria. The other thing is topsoil management. When you go into a site, this is going to sound silly, but I don't think it is. Wound and, and uh, surgical procedure. We learned a long time ago that you have to watch the bacteria on your body. You have to prepare before you insert into the body. Well, it's kind of an analogy to that, to surgery. When you break open the soil to harvest soil, you, you don't want to mix the top soil with the soil you're going to be using. You want to be able to move it aside not only because you may want to restore it later, I'm hoping at some point in the future we'll have a, a, a session on uh, site restoration after. Uh, that's a different topic. But anyway, you want to move it aside so that you can restore the site after the fact, because topsoil is a valuable commodity. And you want to watch your drainage. You don't want to let water accumulate in there. Then after that, it's personal protection. We talked about restoration. That's pretty simple. Uh, just wearing a respirator. You want to have your vaccinations. Tetanus, hepatitis are probably the two main ones you may want to you may want to have infections. There are there's an amazing the polio is found in the soil. It's still found in the soil. Even though we think we eradicated it, it's still in the soil. It's just out of the human population. Uh, you probably want to have TB testing because some of these things, if you are going to be accumulating these things, they could be aggravating the tuberculosis bacillus in your lungs, so TB testing. Most, a lot of workers don't have this, are not involved in that world of getting these shots as child, in their childhood and whatnot. So this is something I think responsible management 
One of the things I've always heard working with earthen people is that a lot of the uh, skills and whatnot are inhabited by the person. There's not, that's not a book written for this sort of thing. You have to learn it. Well, the corollary to that is the person who does learn it is a valuable person. They're not interchangeable parts. So you would think you would want to take care of them. And also, many of these diseases don't kill you outright. They degrade your health. They slow you down. Uh, they make you less productive. So uh, you would think these are kind of common sense things to protect your workforce. And, to, and it's also a matter of social justice. You don't want to, because these things can ruin a person's life. Because many of these diseases, you, you get, especially silicosis, it takes 15 to 20 years to occur. And uh, once you have it, you, you can't easily get, be gotten rid of. And also daily hygiene. Remember we talked about the contact. Simple, simply washing off, cleaning your skin at the end of the day, and prompt first aid for cuts. These are kind of common sensible things that really don't cost any money. Uh, I think uh, the, the key takeaway of this thing is that the soil, there is a hazard there by being aware of where the hazard is and taking simple precautions, you can eliminate, essentially eliminate the hazard just by knowing what you're doing. And that's my presentation. Huh? Any questions? Now, remember, uh, if I, I know this was rather, probably pretty quick, and I had to leave a lot of stuff out, especially about the soil. Uh, but any questions? Yeah, I've got one. You make me afraid to play in the soil anymore. <laughs> I didn't realize there was that much stuff that's going on. So um, the chances of really picking up something, like you said, most of them, the reactions are small and degradable, maybe tired, and, and they're not going. Not everything's going to kill you. So um, is this something that is present in all soils so much? I mean, you know, I mean, is there anything that's safe? I mean, other than doing these precautions, can we feel like confident that maybe this soil over here is going to be okay? Or Well, you can always have it tested, but except given that there are tens of thousands of different strains of bacteria, uh, you're not going to know what it is. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, uh, simple, simple hygiene uh, is probably the best measure. The reason why this is important for the earthen worker, just as it is for a coal miner or anybody who is constantly exposed to the free materials, is they're constantly exposed to so just the probabilities of infection go up. Most of us go out and tinker in the garden on the weekend, and the probabilities are low because number one, we're lazy, we're probably not out there every day tinkering in the garden. But uh, for somebody who's exposed to it every single day, you saw that child with a bandana on. How many of us have seen uh, Adobe workers working with a bandana on their face? I mean, that, that, stops, almost, that stops small birds. I mean, that's about the small, a lot of dust gets in the even if you wet it, you're still getting in. You're breathing in a lot more than you think. Many of them, I see them, folks go out there and they'll wash their mouth out and spit it out because they have a taste of my mouth in the soil. So that's, you're spitting out some of the soil, but you're probably not spitting out all of it. A lot of it goes in through your nose. You don't even know it goes in because it's so small. You can't feel it. You can't taste it. So, uh, yes. Please. What does this mean for the soil we transport in the form of earth and blocks into our home? Well, once this, that, that, that's a very good point. If the number one of the soil is clean to begin with, if you harvest it from the right layer, it probably has very little bacteria count to begin with. Most of these soils, uh, most of the infections harm somebody who's already had their health degraded. These are cumulative problems, not... Did you mention the, the African floors and a person right? who made an earthen right. floor and there was all the bacteria Well, that's natural for earth, unprepared. When you put down a rammed earth floor and you put a coating on it, you're sealing off the the, the route of infection for the, for the uh, especially the hook problem. That's the, most, the one most accumulated by walking on earth and floor. But to answer your question, once the material is out of the soil, clean, compressed, probably stabilized, and Drive. Most of these things, these bacteria cannot survive with uh, humidities less than about 80%. Mm -hmm. Most, of, some, most bacteria, well, not all most of them, but many of them will form a spore that will go into a dormant phase, which is essentially back to a 
quasi-chemical stage. And they will stay that way until the conditions are favorable. Many of them will eventually perish. As well. Many of them will last hundreds of years. You heard about, uh, they, uh, recently a reindeer was in, in Siberia, was thawed out. The reindeer died of anthrax probably a hundred years ago, and they infected a child, and the child died. Wow. What? Uh, so these, the funny thing about bacteria and virus, they are immortal. They will never die. They do not have our lifespan. What happens is they get eaten, or viruses can get chemically attached to particles and they become immortalized. They can be dissolved chemically, and, but they don't live like them. They are, they are human. <laughs> well, does the lime that you might stabilize a earthen blacks would kill and some, pathogens? Some, most soils do not like alkaline environment, high, high pH, but some are adaptable to it. Although a pH of around 11 or 12 probably is going to kill them. Hmm. It depends on the height, how much pH. Yeah. <clears throat> My understanding from soils in terms of gardening mm -hmm. is that you've got this whole microbiome which is in your organic layer like you were talking about but it's got like good nematodes and bad nematodes or whatever and there's a whole um ecosystem i guess that is going on and so that the the in a lot of cases the good keep the bad in control and you can work with you know, balancing out what's, does that, does that, how does that fit with what you're talking about in terms of? Well, you're of right, there are, there are uh, some 10,000 different species of nematodes and whatnot. Uh, most of them are benign, they do not infect us. There are some of them that are. Nature is all about balance. I said the bacteria are immortal, well that's true, but they can be eaten. And that's kind of how they keep themselves in balance. Uh, otherwise, it would be over. The world be overrun. We've always heard about these problems. If you eliminate one species, you know, the other species they ate, you know, flourishes. Well, that's true in the soils as well. So there's a natural balance to the soil. We go into it at our own risk uh, that we will encounter some of those bugs. Typically, it's not just one bug that will infect you. You have to be exposed to a lot of them to actually overwhelm your own body's defenses. Mm. Some of these bugs, uh, maybe the bacteria, the protozoa, are what they call frank bacteria meaning they can infect anyone, and they can make them very sick. There's a limited number of frank bacteria. Most of them are uh, parasitic. They will degrade your health. They will become part of your body and simply live in you, and especially the nematodes. That, there are some terrible pictures to show what nematodes can do, and what they do, in fact, do uh, in the uh, third world. It's a, it's a, it's a you wouldn't believe what, they're, what they do to you. Anyway, uh, so there is balance in nature. We, in, we go into it at our own risk. Be aware of what you're doing, and you can eliminate that risk down to background noise. But don't we also have like tons of bio, microbiome in our own bodies? Of course we do, yes. But so, I mean, it's not like... They're adapted, I don't know. <laughs> they're adapted to live with us. Don't, don't understand. Well, they are beneficial bacteria. They help us digest our food. They evolve. Some of them, and then there's some that aren't. Well, sure. Good, yeah, sure. No, we all know we've all been we sick. We've all had the bug, uh, diarrhea, or whatever. Uh, so it's a matter of the same thing occurs in nature. You saw that little bacteria coated with viruses. I mean, they have their problems too. <laughs> oh, I was wondering. Um, you said coating the floor properly. I think some people might just think mixing it with linseed oil is enough to, that's the finish on the floor, the earthen floor, right? Like what would you coat it with to not get hook warm? Well, yeah, linseed is used here. Uh, the lady I'm working with, they have a proprietary uh, mix they've developed with local oils and whatnot that are available. And that does it, just mixing it with yeah. an oil coating? For instance, here, we often have, we use, uh, what is it, boric acid. You'll mix in boric acid or uh, some kind of diatomaceous earth. There's various things you can do to discourage the migration of bugs through the, uh, through the soil. But if, like, if you're walking outside barefoot and it's soil and then you walk inside, I mean, what's the difference? Yeah, well, take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Use a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. 
I mean, there's there's a risk. Most of those, the nematodes, the worst parts of them are tropical because they like warm, moist soil to complete their life cycles. Now, in this kind of weather we have, this is not favorable weather for nematodes. In fact, most farmers like it to have a harsh winter because that kills off a lot of the, the, the species at the low end for the next year's planting. They have much fewer, much smaller populations of features to deal with. It's like Stromaloides dercalis is, I think, all over the U.S. in the soil. Probably is. But again, the, the, the problem with most of these things is the uh, how many you encounter and what your general health is. All the more reason to avoid uh, some of these because it's kind of a vicious circle. You start to get ill, and you're not taking these precautions. And these are, these are parasitic animals that will take, take advantage of a degraded immune system. So just, uh, the, the, the purpose of all this is to get this, the very last slide. It shows that with a little common sense and a little awareness of where the problem occurs in the soil, you can avoid the problem altogether. And that's the caution for the earth worker and the, and, and the, and the uh, employers. On that one. It's not something that, uh, like I said, this is inside baseball. Most people are never going to experience it. If you go to earth and home or around earth, you're not going to see any of this because typically the moisture content of the walls are going to drop to very low levels and the bacteria can't survive in that circumstance. I think the biggest takeaway for me is another reason to, you know, properly um, remove your topsoil. Right. Yeah. There's two reasons. I, I think Stephen and I can both tell a story about a fellow who, uh, another earthen, or another environmental guru, who is adamantly against soil, uh, soil construction because he says it degrades or it destroys the topsoil. Well, you can see from this, you don't want the topsoil. You want to manage the topsoil. Topsoil is actually a very scarce resource, becoming more scarce than we realize. So we need to develop some kind of the best practices for managing topsoil. And uh, putting it aside not only for the valuable resource, but also for health reasons. And then harvest what you need of the subsoil and put it back. Are you going to recommend a dirt book? Well, yeah, there's two good books, actually three, three books, but two good books. One is sort of lyrical. It talks about the wonders of the, soft, 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 the skin of the earth. And the other one is rather, in my opinion, rather dour. It, it also understands how much we depend upon this. So soils are an existential part of our world. Without soils, we die. We take it for granted, but that's the simple truth. This other book says, um, we are not taking care of our soils. We are all familiar with the dust bowl years when we harvest it. I'm working with some folks at Lamar University on what to do with all the soil that washes down our rivers. Our man-made activities have multiplied the natural erosion by a factor of 10. And all that washes out to sea or clogs our harbors. We're trying to figure out how to recover that and to reuse it either for earthen construction or to put it back in the soil because it's so valuable. So it's a big deal. Every year the Corps of Engineers spends scores of millions of dollars and has for a hundred years uh, cleaning out harbors and whatnot. And we don't have a solution to what to do with this kind of business. Uh, we have a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And we have a dead zone because that's a different so, uh, like I said, inside baseball, a little precaution is not an issue. Take it for granted, it can become an issue. Thank you. Thank you.